Okay, this is the intro to the recording for the archive for the first day of Unleavened Bread. We'll be streaming live on the Facebook Live Sabbath service page. We'll put a recording of this into the archive on COGTV.org. So let's bring in... Oh, let me get the... Uh, let me get the closed captioning going first. <clears throat> Make sure that that is active and working. Looks like it is. Let's bring in the <clears throat> the Facebook Live people. Haksameyak, happy first day of unleavened bread to those of you watching on Facebook Live. And yes, we got the green light, so it looks like we are streaming there. And uh, hope you had a good night to be much observed last night. I said greetings to some of you from where I went last night out to a restaurant where there were some other brethren observing night to be much observed. <clears throat> I wound up, as some, some of you saw on my Facebook post, I wound up being the last Mohican <clears throat> in that restaurant. And I, uh, I sure enjoyed getting out and doing that and celebrating the evening and what, that, what the evening means. God delivering our forefathers out of Egypt, which symbolizes and pictures sin. Now, for <clears throat> the first day of Unleavened Bread this morning, we're going to be having a sermon by God's end-time apostle, Herbert Armstrong, from a recording with video and streaming text, not just closed captions. We'll actually have the pre-typed text, and <clears throat> that'll be from a sermon that God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong gave on the first day of Unleavened Bread back in 1981. Now we'll do that for the morning service in the U.S., which is the afternoon p.m. service in the U.K. And then again this afternoon in the U.S., we'll have Mr. Armstrong's sermon from the first day of Unleavened Bread that he gave in 1985, along with scrolling text. So we got a this is a double Sabbath today in several ways. It's not a back-to-back -back double Sabbath, but it's a double Sabbath in the sense that it's a regular weekly Sabbath day today on which the annual Sabbath of the first day of Unleavened Bread falls. And as you'll hear Mr. Armstrong say, I believe it's in this first day of Unleavened Bread sermon from 1981 that he'll say this morning, yeah, in fact, I picked this one because he starts out explaining that this today, the first day of unleavened bread, is the first holy day of the year, of seven holy days. And he makes a brief mention, if you're listening closely, you'll hear this. He makes a brief mention of the fact that there are seven feast days, or not days, but seven feasts, because some of the feasts are not just one day. Some of the feasts are a week long, like the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We call it the Days, plural, of Unleavened Bread. Days of Unleavened Bread. That Feast of the Days of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Unleavened Bread, is a seven-day feast. One feast, but seven days. And now, being one feast with seven days on the first day of Unleavened Bread and the last day of Unleavened Bread being Holy days, the first day of holy day, the seventh day, the last day of unleavened bread of holy day. That means you've got two holy days in that one feast. But it's only one feast. <clears throat> and as Mr. Armstrong explains, you'll hear him. I just want you to think this through ahead of time. So if you're not aware of this before, you might say, oh, Mr. Armstrong's got that wrong. Well, no, he doesn't. <clears throat> you, you've got to precisely uh, you know, you got to discern the truth with preciseness sometimes. Let me come in a little closer with you. Here as we're all waking up uh, this morning after a night to be much observed. Hopefully you didn't stay up too terribly late celebrating that last night. But even though I was the last of the Mohicans in the restaurant, now I did come back and to have things ready for this morning. I, I did stay up a little while after I even got back from going out last night. But the point Mr. Armstrong is going to make that I'm kind of clarifying ahead of time for you uh, is that there are seven feast days. The Passover is a feast day, but it is not a holy day. And to understand that, by definition, 
A holy day is a day that God sanctifies, sets apart, upon which we assemble and do no servile work. Now, Passover, we assemble for foot washing memorial service, but that doesn't have to be an assembly uh, in a local congregation where the whole congregation assembles together. It can be done in your home. It all depends on what <clears throat> the leader at the time is calling for. When Mr. Armstrong was alive, we did meet together as a congregation for the Passover foot washing memorial, unless there were reasons why a person were too far away or handicapped, couldn't get in. Accommodations for that were made. <clears throat> Some of us would even be sent out to people who were in nursing homes. Like I would, I was assigned for several years. I was seeing her every night of the week anyway and reading her mail and feeding her because Alberta Carlson was paralyzed from the neck down in a nursing home after retiring from working full-time for the legal department in her elder, elder, elder years. And uh, I'd be assigned to go hook up the speaker system so she could hear the Passover service from headquarters. And in her situation, paralyzed, she couldn't wash anybody's feet and nobody would, you know, wash hers <clears throat> other than their nursing staff there. Uh, but she would listen in and she would partake of the drinking of the wine, the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine, symbolizing Christ's broken body and his blood poured out for us. <clears throat> and so I'd bring some of them bread, I'd bring some wine, and and I would, uh, you know, she she paralyzed from the neck down. She couldn't do it herself, but as I would often feed her during the week anyway, I would give her the, uh, I'd give her the piece of broken bread, and I would uh, give her the little glass of wine to sip when we did that part and I'd turn and do mine too <clears throat> but uh, so people are accommodated for Passover but it's not in a commanded assembly um, in the scripture it's not something that we, we could do at our homes in fact as, as it was originally instituted it would be done in a person's home they'd paint blood over their door seals and you know so now that we're scattered we've gone back largely uh, for those of you that meet here especially, we've gone back to assembling in our homes and keeping Passover at home. Mr. Armstrong has instructions for that. And it's a feast day. It's not a commanded assembly, congregational-wise, church-wide. It's not a day on which you're commanded to not do any servile work. So it's, it's a feast day only, although it's noted God's end time apostle has emphasized, pointed out, it is the most solemn feast day of all the feasts. It's the most solemn feast of all the feasts for the entire year, the Passover, and the meaning it has and the, the tremendous sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Now, we're in the Passover season. People often call the Passover and unleavened bread as time of Passover. It's spring, the first spring feast. It's actually the first two spring feasts because Passover is a separate feast and Days of Unleavened Bread is, a, is another feast, but it's all part of the Passover season. So sometimes people give you this greeting, Happy Passover, meaning the whole season. Um, and that, that that's fine more or less as long as you have the understanding we have two separate feasts going here. Same way for Feast of Tabernacles. People refer to that eight-day period by Feast of Tabernacles, but it actually is only a seven-day feast itself, and the eighth day is a whole another separate feast, the last great day. Same, same kind of principle, same kind of thing. But on the point where Mr. Armstrong says there are seven feasts and there's seven holy days. Now, if you counted Passover as if it were a holy day, that'd make eight holy days, but there's not eight holy days. Passover is not a holy day upon which you cannot do any servile work or have to do a commanded church-wide, congregational-wide assembly. Um, all right, so just clarifying that, it's a feast day, and what makes seven holy days when you're not counting Passover as a holy day, which we should not because it's not a holy day, 
you just count it as a feast day, what keeps there from being uh, eight feast days is that the fact that and, and, and although the Feast of Unleavened Bread has two holy days in it, you only count the Feast of Unleavened Bread as one feast. Two holy days in that feast, but one feast. Now, in the Feast of Tabernacles, there's only one holy day. The first day of the Feast of Tabernacles is the holy day. The last day of the Feast of Tabernacles is not a holy day, but the separate eighth day after the Feast of Tabernacles, the last great day, is a holy day. So you got two different feasts at Feast of Tabernacles time, the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, the last great day. Those are two feasts, and they are two holy days. But during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there is one feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but two holy days in that feast. I know that can become confusing. Well, maybe I ought to type it up and stick it on the screen and say, show you Passover feast day. Put two columns. And you don't put Passover in the holy day side. You just put it on the feast day side. You go to the next feast, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Days of Unleavened Bread. It's on the feast side. It's listed as one feast, but you got to list it. You got to have an extra column, an extra row under Feast of Unleavened Bread on the holy day side because you got two holy days within the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then you count the rest of them and you wind up with seven feast days, seven holy days, because Passover's not a holy day. Days of Unleavened Bread, the one Feast of Unleavened Bread has two holy days in it. All right, I know I did that kind of quickly. I should have grafted that. I might do that later in the afternoon, but I need to move us along now because we need to make a reminder after we sing a hymn, I'll make a reminder that today is the day, a holy day offering day. It's the only time you ever get pitched for an offering, and we have to do it on the holy days, is to remind you this is a day we're not to appear empty before the eternal. We'll uh, go through the couple of scriptures that relate to that quickly after a hymn, and then get right into Mr. Armstrong's sermon that he gave on the first day of Unleavened Bread in 1981 with uh, scrolling text with it that's that's been pre-typed out. Now we have the closed caption for those who ask me who said, look, we're hard of hearing. Can you get some big closed captions on the screen for us? <clears throat> so I got a device that does it pretty well, almost 100%. It'll goof up a word once in a while, especially if the speaker is not enunciating clearly, or if the speaker goes a little too fast. And I, we pre-typed Mr. Armstrong because, brethren, as you know, he's a long experienced broadcaster who, to captivate people's attention, he learned how to pack a lot of things and a lot of words into a, a short space, and he can really punch things out and sometimes closed captioning devices cannot always keep up accurately with Mr. Armstrong and some of the recordings we have are older and were recorded with a microphone somebody holding a microphone picking it up off the speaker system <clears throat> and and th those would be the only recordings we have and the uh, closed caption devices do not work as well on those kind of recordings so we have him all typed out but let's begin I hope everybody's kind of settled now and you're, you're ready to get into services. We'll sing a hymn together. Remind you of today being the Holy Day offering. If you've got a place you've already got in mind for, you've been helping a local minister who helps you, you know, I'll just remind you, well, be sure that you do that. You're giving it to God and through the way that God's led you to do it. Now, if you don't have a place in mind, I'll, I'll tell you how you can send it to this ministry, which will appreciate it. Whenever I ask you during the rest of the year, I've got a goal of operating World Watch Sunday through Thursday nights, strictly off of two retirement incomes I have. And uh, and yet, there are reasons why I'll mention in a moment, we'll appreciate it. I've put myself out to about $15,000 worth of equipment I bought here on high paying interest rate things like 29, 25 to 30% interest rates. That's gonna have me <laughs> strapped for the next 15 years if if some of you don't help out this ministry on the holy days 
uh, and it'll be a great relief to knock some of those debts down at the at those high interest rates. So uh, I just mentioned that because if you don't have a place in mind, you're already doing it. You're very welcome to do it here, even though I never on Sabbath days, regular Sabbath days, and during World Watch, I never make a mention for uh, support or offerings or any of that kind of thing. But on holy days, we have to, and I'm just saying today that it'll be welcome if you want to do it here. I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. Let's go to a hymn first, and then we'll go to the scriptures on that. Now, let's see. As we go to the hymn, we'll have scrolling lyrics with the hymn. So I'm going to go ahead and switch off the closed caption screen. Let me just come out for a moment while I dive behind that screen and switch it over. Just stand with us, stand by with us. We'll switch to the hymn and go right to a hymn that you'll see on your screen here. Let's do this one, brethren. Let's see. Let me come back in tighter and see what that is. We'll do this one from Psalm 44. As we start this morning service, we'll ask the Eternal who never sleeps to awake to our prayers as we start to suffer the trials the rest of the world is going through and will be going through as the fifth seal prepares to open up. We've seen the beginning of troubles already going worldwide in trouble, and that's in building up to what Jesus Christ described in Matthew 24, verse 20, 21, as the worst time of trouble since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever after, a time that's coming sooner than later. And I didn't mean to get too long with the closed captions off, but I just want to tell you where that verse is in Matthew 24, verse uh, 21. For then shall be great trouble, mega trouble, great tribulation as the King James Version renders it, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time coming, no nor ever shall be hereafter either, time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 31. So we want the eternal to be awake when we uh, say, Father, I'm suffering the same stuff you've got allowing on the rest of the world to help. Please awake to my cry. You know, and so let's sing that together, brethren, and wake us up this morning. Psalm 44, from page 35 in the purple hymnal, but we'll have, we'll have the, the uh, scrolling lyrics on the screen for you. From Psalm 44, awake, O eternal. And if I'm awake, I'll have the right button push to bring, uh, to bring to bring this screen full forward. So that screen is, I think it's screen number four. Let me try that. Nope, wrong one. Steven, uh, bring it back here, and that'll be uh, button my button number three here. All right, let's all, brethren, on this first holy day of the year, this first day of Unleavened Bread, let's all sing heartily together, Awake, O eternal oh and this is a cappella Everybody sing along, even though it says women. We have forgotten the name of our God. Run to some idol or shed abroad. Shall not the Almighty who sees all within and knows the heart's secrets discover? Everybody on the last verse now. Yea, all day long for thy 
Christ's sake we're consumed Like sheep by the slaughter to death Brethren, for those of you who uh, sang along with us, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, let's see, whoa, 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 wait a second here. We're going to hold up and uh, do another hymn as we close, I just, because we've got to go through the uh, a reminder, a couple of scriptures that uh, remind us that today is the day to not appear before the eternal empty, and He promises blessings if you do. And absent those blessings, it's as if it were cursing, because sometimes the way things are going economically today and the way they're going to be going, brethren, we wind up needing those blessings from the eternal to just be able to, uh, to survive everything. So let me bring the first of the scriptures we have on this forward. Let's see. Yeah, okay, this would be the first one, and then... Uh, that's the same screen we were playing the hymn from, so that's going to be, let's see if I remember that. I think, is that going to be this button? Yes. All right, the first of our scriptures related to the Holy Day offering, as we often, as we always do, turn to Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, where it reminds us that it's three times in a year. Now, that those times are seasons. You've got... Well, it's going to explain it right here. It's going to explain what those three seasons are right inside this verse. Three times, or you know, under, with understanding, that's three seasons in a year, in the year, shall all the males appear before the eternal Lord your God in the place which he shall choose in. Here's the first of those three seasons. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. The second of those seasons is, and in the Feast of Weeks, or the Pentecost, or Pentecost. And the third of those three times, or three seasons, is, and in the Feast of Tabernacles. <clears throat> and then at the end of this verse, as you can see on your screen, it says, And you shall not appear before the eternal Lord your God empty. <clears throat> now we'll go on to verse 17 in a moment, but I want to just back up and explain for those who've heard arguments out there that some are making, some who even are have people who have been in the ministry, but in many cases, some of these ministers out there that some of you may be listening to from time to time have actually been put out of the church. They've been disfellowshipped, defrocked even, by God's end-time apostle and pastor general, Herbert W. Armstrong. That means we should not be listening to those people. Some of you are tuning in on them and saying, oh, rah, rah, listen to him. Isn't he exciting? And all the intelligence he has and all the little facts and boom, boom, you see he can put out there. Brethren, if you just grab a good Dake's Annotated Reference Bible, that's where a lot of these boom, boom ministers are getting their little exciting, titillating facts and tidbits. Uh, Dake spent a lifetime putting together all kind of notes of details and telling you how many... U.S. dollars a talent, you know, is or the size of this or that uh, related to cubits, how, how big it is in feet and inches or, or in meters for the U.K. <clears throat> and you think, oh, these guys are fabulous. Well, they're, just, they're just getting it out of references you can buy in your bookstore. And uh, some ministers would laugh and joke about that, how, you know, boy, I had my audience eating out of the palm of my hand because I took my dakes up there with them and gave them all that detail. They didn't know where I was getting it from, and they didn't tell them. <clears throat> um, it's by inspiration of God that is what you want, and these men who've been cut off from God, they're not under God's inspiration, and God may want to get a certain message over to you, so you need to be careful and pay attention to who's been disfellowship, who's been defrocked from ministry, and avoid them. And then pray for the ministers you know who are remaining faithful and that God will guide and lead their speaking and that he will also dynamically, by his Spirit, guide and lead your hearing. 
because a minister may say something and two people praying that God will inspire him and that he'll inspire their hearing may hear two different things even though the minister it seems only said one thing and the two things may they may hear may be in between the lines one hearing something here one's hearing something here that wasn't the exact statement he said but inspired that because of God answering your prayer to inspire your hearing as well and it may inspire the minister to say something on the moment because of something in your life that happens while he is speaking live I've experienced that happening to me like I'll have a certain direction I think I'm going and then boom this thought comes in my head that just replaces everything else for the moment and I can't think of anything else I have to say well that's God's giving me something he wants me to say and I say what the thoughts are he puts in my head I've experienced that myself brother so I know how that works and <clears throat> and it encur should be an encouragement for you to remember before you sit before a minister on a whole especially on a holy day that you pray God will inspire his speaking you can do that even while he's speaking live even right now some of you could you know like the movie liar liar is a great one where somebody prayed that the attorney wouldn't be able to lie and he got up there planned a big lie and he stood up there and blurbed out the whole truth before the court which worked against his client but worked in favor of those for whom the truth worked you know so uh, it was funny done in a movie but it actually works in real life you can pray God will you know inspire it may not be what you want God to have inspired but if you pray for the inspiration, God will respond to it. I, I, I very, I'm very personally aware of that. All right, at the moment I'm getting the thought, get back to the Holy Day offering, and then let's get to Mr. Armstrong's sermon. The point I wanted to make, though, about the, some ministers who have been disfellowshipped, they're out there preaching against the way God's apostle instructed us that during these three times in the year that we're not to appear empty, Mr. Armstrong said it so that we would give a holy day offering on each of the seven holy days. And so some are pointing to, see, this says three times, not seven. But what they're, what they're misconstruing or what they're doing in trying to create division and strife and bring people over to them about how intelligent they are, they're not that intelligent. They're just rebellious. You, you know, uh, one analogy that might help you understand this, let me go ahead and bring it back on the screen full screen again here for while well, I tell you this you know how many weeks are there in a month brethren you know it's a little over four usually it's 4.3 but basically there in most months there's four full weeks so if your leader told you to do something every week uh, you know throughout the whole year they'd, uh, the way we go on the Roman calendar there'd be 52 weeks you know you do it 52 times but somebody might say well there's only 12 months in the year well your leaders not telling you to do something monthly he's telling you to do it weekly in this case during the three seasons there's a total of seven holy days within those three seasons and your leader said divide up your annual offering that you would bring to God on, you know, as, as, as the offering for these three times in the year, divide it not by three, but divide it by seven. And that doesn't mean, let me come back with you for a second, brother, that doesn't mean you have to be rigidly saying in advance, I'm going to give, let me just pick a number. This may be too small for some of you, might be too much for others, but Let's see. Let me take a number that would divide by seven. I'm going to take a big number. Let's take 700. Let's say that your income <clears throat> were such and your blessings were such in your life that you said, what I want to give back to God cheerfully and as an offering to God over and above my tithes, my tithes and offerings, I want to give God $700 this year. Now, that might change throughout the year. You might say that at the beginning of the year, but it, maybe you're... And you lose your job, your income decreases, you might want to lower that during the rest of the year, during the, you know, as the day, holy days come up. Or you might get an extra blessing and you might decide later in the year to increase 
increase it. <clears throat> but let's just say generally you said that, or you just reason this out, that for the whole year, I want to give God $700 during those seven holy days. And if you, if you did it equally, $100 each holy day, um, <clears throat> it would still total out 700 But if we were doing it on just if we were only doing an offering on three occasions instead of seven, well, you'd still have figured I'm given 700, but instead of dividing it by seven and equally $100 each time, you'd divide it by three, and you'd what would that come out to be? It's kind of hard math. The three doesn't divide evenly into 700, but it'd be a little over $200 each time. Uh, not quite 250, maybe 230, 240, somewhere in there <clears throat> that you'd give <clears throat> each time if you were only doing three times you're still giving the same amount of money in a year so these people making arguments against the way god's end time apostle instructed us to do it on each holy day and when we read the next scripture you're going to see what mr armstrong instructed us uh, harmonizes with is proved by follows uh, uh, is supported by scripture about each holy day when we get to leviticus 23 you'll see that we're to do an offering on each of the holy days so the way mr armstrong instructed us to do it on each holy day seven times in the year uh, you know seven holy days in the year it fits within this scripture that says three times let me pull it forward three times in a year shall the males appear before the lord your god and they shall not appear empty well uh, those three times, those three seasons, you just divide it up between the holy days within each time, within each season. In the first season, the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's mentioned first here in the pink, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you're going to have two holy days, <clears throat> and one at the beginning of the feast, one at the end. So you, whatever you're going to give for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you just divide it by two, and you know, and you might do 60 40 or 40 60 maybe not 50 50 but you just divide it by two and give part of it on the first day and the other part on the second day the seventh day of unleavened bread the second holy day within feast of unleavened bread then <clears throat> during the second feast of the year there's only one holy day in that one the, the feast of weeks it's only pentecost so of your two times there's three holy days already now this this last time, this last season, the Feast of Tabernacles, there, that, that season, the Feast of Tabernacles is your fall season, which includes, by general reference, just like some people call this time of Passover and unleavened bread, they'll just call it the Passover season. Some people call the fall season the Feast of Tabernacles season. Well, it includes four holy days. It starts with the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of the seventh month, followed by Ten days, nine days later, on the tenth day of the second seventh month, follow, uh, with the day of atonement, followed five days later on the fifteenth of the seventh month, tenth day of the seventh month to the fifteenth. There's five days in between. Uh, with the feast, of, first day of the feast of tabernacles, that's three holy days, and then the last great day following the feast of tabernacles, the eighth day of the feast, is your fourth holy day within the fall season within the feast of tabernacles season or time that's broken up here as part of the three times so you got two during the first time the feast of unleavened bread one during Pente the feast of weeks pentecost so that's three holy days and four holy days during that third time of the year that fall season that feast of tabernacles season or time with trumpets atonement tabernacles and last great day four so you got two at 11 bread plus pentecost that's three plus four at feast of tabernacles time fall season that's seven holy days in all that fall within the three times mentioned up here in this verse 16 of deuteronomy 16 all right let's go on now to verse 17 where <clears throat> God through Moses said, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Oh, I'm sorry. We're, I, did I have verse 17 up here? Yes, I do. Uh, let me cover this first. Stay in context with Deuteronomy 17. Well, actually, there's a reason I split that up. Let's come back to verse 17 of Deuteronomy 16. 
I'll just while it's up here, I'll just read it though. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the eternal Lord your God, which he has given you. We'll come back to that verse. I'll elaborate in a moment, but let's back up to this this uh, slide <clears throat> that references Deuteronomy 23 and verse 34. God saying through Moses to Moses, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of the seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days unto the eternal Lord your God. All right, all caps, we're using Yahweh, we're explaining it as Mr. Armstrong did, as as the Hebrew English lexicons explain, you know, the it's the eternal Lord your God. Speak unto the children on this 15th day of the seventh month, and that's what today is. And by the way, brethren, I showed some of you last night at the, uh, from the restaurant, I put on my table, a little folding card like I have here in my hands. This is not just a standard business card. Um, it's double size business card and has a fold in the middle so that when you fold it, it, it uh, you sit it on a table or a desk and it'll sit up. And uh, well, especially if the desk is flat, it'll sit up. And uh, on the one side you can see a calendar with very bold lettering, even though it's a small business card size very bold numbering, and it has the 12 months of the year. And the holy days, the feast days and the holy days are highlighted in different colors. I've got Passover in red, like Christ pouring out his blood, and I've got that sliding over into the evening portion of the 29th of March, which was two days ago, Thursday evening after sunset. We celebrated, memorialized Christ's sacrifice with the Passover memorial foot washing service and the taking of the bread and wine, breaking of the bread and partaking of that and drinking the wine, got Christ's blood. And then the 30th I have colored with, uh, you know, the red being Passover until the evening. I bring a purple color in the evening portion through today, March 31, as the annual holy day, the first holy day of the year, the first day of unleavened bread. And then I've got seven weeks colored in green from the wave sheaf day, which is tomorrow. It's the morrow after the Sabbath during the days of unleavened bread. Today is the first day of unleavened bread. Tomorrow is, and it's, it is the Sabbath. It's Even though today is an annual Sabbath, it's also the weekly Sabbath today. And from the weekly Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread, and today's a great example for those that have to put the, wrap your mind around it. This is the weekly Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread today, even though it is also the first day of Unleavened Bread, an annual Sabbath. It's a double Sabbath in that sense. It is an annual Sabbath. It is also a weekly Sabbath, because today is the regular weekly Sabbath. And it doubles as the annual Sabbath today. Two in one. Annual Sabbath and weekly Sabbath rolled into one, wrapped together today. A, sort, a double Sabbath compacted. Not a back-to-back -back Sabbath, but a double Sabbath, same day, weekly Sabbath, annual Sabbath. This makes this the zero target Sabbath day for the count to Pentecost, with tomorrow being the morrow after the Sabbath during the Days of Unleavened Bread, as re you know, our, as our understanding and reference goes related to Leviticus 23, verse verses 15 and 16. <clears throat> and then we count beginning with, from is the wrong preposition, it's not part of the original Hebrew word, the King James translators and other translators picked the wrong word, and some of them even admitted it, even said they would change it, but then they didn't change it, and their new new versions that came out, as they promised Mr. Armstrong they would do. They didn't keep their word. The chairman of that re revising committee said, yeah, you're right, Mr. Armstrong, we should change that, and I'll see to it that we do. <clears throat> but somehow his editors over him, I guess, didn't allow him to do it, so that, that didn't get changed. It's still incorrectly worded with a preposition that's not part of the original Hebrew in Leviticus 23, verses 15, 16. It should say, as God's end time apostle has explained in there, this is just a side point, and it relates very much to today, because today is the trigger Sabbath that triggers 
the wave sheaf day tomorrow, because that's described in Leviticus 23, verses 15 and 16, as being the wave sheaf day is the morrow after the Sabbath. It's tomorrow after you do the stuff that 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 is described as, with understanding, the Sabbath that falls during the days of unleavened bread. So this is the zero Sabbath, the trigger Sabbath. I say zero Sabbath because next Sabbath will be the first Sabbath since the wave sheaf day that ends the first week of Sunday through first day through Sabbath weeks that you count seven weeks and then after that seventh Sabbath end of that seventh week after that seventh Sabbath the morrow after that seventh Sabbath is counted as number 50 Pentecost we'll go through that another time I, I just mentioning those points and mentioning that I have a little calendar I printed that fits on your desk real nicely. I did it different from last year. The calendar's printed much more boldly, even for people with bad eyes. You can see this. And I'm, just, I'm mentioning this because I'm giving this away. Uh, this uh, day we're pitching you for an offering because God requires that we remind you and that, that you come not empty. And today is the 15th of the first month. Now, Thursday night was the 14th. By the way, somebody got on another side point, and I, I got to mention this and explain why I deleted that comment on my Facebook page for where I put my picture where I was out last night and showed you I had this little calendar. <clears throat> and somebody boldly posted on my post in the comments a statement that would cause division if I allowed it to, could cause division, and that represents lack of harmony and lack of doing what Christ said do in 1 Corinthians 10 <clears throat> one I'm sorry 1 Corinthians 1 verses 10 and 11 where he says we should all speak the same thing brethren don't listen to these kooks and nuts out there that are going in rebellion and causing division and not following the instruction God gave us through his end time apostle saying look brethren Hillel was inspired by God to tell us how the Levitical priesthood was calculating the calendar all along. And then they would make the visual observations, and it always, you know, God does things in duality often, and he has backups and proofs. The Levitical priesthood could not only prove from observation that, all right, this is the correct day in our calculations, but vice versa. Our calculations are proving correct because our vis visible observation is showing there's the first little crescent of, 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 the, of the moon, the new moon. But that, there's two things, two or three things wrong with people that are trying to keep new moons today. One of the problems is there, there is not a Levitical priesthood in existence. Christ has changed the priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood right now. We'll go back to a Levitical priesthood after Christ returns and he'll be over it Christ will be over that priesthood then they'll make observations from Israel from the Middle East from Jerusalem that's where you're supposed to do the observation not here in the United States or not our brethren uh, Ephraim over in the UK not from there not from anywhere except from Jerusalem and then they had a system of signals, you know, trumpet blasts they would do that would be carried, uh, uh, not like handing off a baton, but the one who would hear it from Jerusalem would sound it for the people in that area, and then in the next area who could hear that area's horn would sound it and, 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 and carry it on down the line to say, hey, the new moon has been seen from Jerusalem. You don't observe, you don't do that from here. And you don't do that when we don't have a Levitical priesthood, as we do not have today a Levitical priesthood. So forget this new moon stuff until Christ returns. You know, circumcision of the heart. Well, circumcision was determined in Acts 15 to be of the heart and not a requirement for Gentiles. Now, some, if you really understand it, it is actually something those of Israel really should still do, but not required on everybody. You know, certain understandings 
when you understand that's for me, but it's not for this other guy. You know, it, it's easy on him. But also it's good health to do circumcision too. So that's a whole other issue. But new moons we don't do without a Levitical priesthood. We don't do it outside of Jerusalem. We don't have a Levitical priesthood in there observing it. And the Levitical priesthood had the oral oracles of God. That means the unwritten word of God that was given to them through Aaron from God and Moses, who also understood it. Was, Moses was over Aaron, his brother, even though Aaron was over the Levitical priesthood. That was God-inspired oracles. They had the calculated calendar all along, but that was kept among them as an order among them, oracly, which kept them in position that God wanted them to have where people would look to the ministry. There are some things God has the ministry do, brethren, that he doesn't tell you about so that you'll look to the minister. You know, if you really want healing today, some of you aren't looking to James 5, 15. That's in the New Testament writing. If you want healing, you are to go to the elders. And it's been explained by God's end-time apostle that I... You know, you do that. If you've got an ordained ministry and it's faithful, that's where you should go when you need an anointing. Not bypassing them and writing off the ordained ministry and spitting all over them, which some are doing because, yes, it's true, there are many who have not been faithful and they've created division they should not have, commit, uh, should not have established and set up. And they're dividing us in ways that is unfortunate because, like, especially for young people. You know, some fella, there might be a gal he would really like if he could see her at the Feast of Tabernacles, but he may not be where his family's going because she's in a different group, and they're going to the same city, meeting maybe even across the street in some cases in a different auditorium or maybe down the street a few blocks. And the guy never gets to see who would have been an ideal candidate for marriage for him, for you young people. Because we ministers of some unfaithfully, on their own, have done what... I'm going to play you a tape that Tom Williams sent me last night from Mr. Armstrong speaking. I have finally a recording. I've been telling you about it for months, about how God inspired Mr. Armstrong to have everybody raise their hands if you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God. And then Mr. Armstrong telling everybody, put your hands down. None of you were ever members of the Worldwide Church of God. It's just a... That's our corporate name. You were not baptized into a corporate name. You were baptized into the body of Christ, the Church of God. I've got a recording of him explaining that. The first time he brought that up, back in 19, what was it, 55, 56, during a, a business meeting, I have the recording. You'll hear Mr. Armstrong's own voice. I'm going to play that this afternoon because we've got to do the, the uh, <clears throat> Holy Day offering reminding reminder this morning, but during the afternoon service with the first day of Unleavened Bread from 1985, <clears throat> we'll have time. I'll play you that recording. Mr. Armstrong saying, brethren, don't say you're members of the radio church of God. Same principle as when he said, don't do the worldwide. Don't say you're members of worldwide. He said, don't say you're members of the radio church of God. And he explains why. It, we had to do a corporate name to distinguish us from the Church of God, um, Indiana, or different ones that got the name legally, Church of God only. He was forced to put an adjective in front of it, a modifier. And so uh, that was just for corporate legal reasons that, you know, and we're not a member. And he said, you're not a member of that. Don't tell people you're a member of the Radio Church of God, and he also later then said, don't tell people you're members of the Worldwide Church of God. You're members of the Church of God. But when you need to get technical, when people say, oh, you're you, of, of, uh, of uh, the Church of God of this or that uh, corporate structure that ha has the name legally Church of God, no, <clears throat> we uh, he explains how to explain it so that you don't say you're a member of it but that you are involved with a different organization that God has established but right now he's got a scattered we'll talk about that this afternoon let's stay with our subject at hand here uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 
verses 10 and 11, important to mention because of the new moon people out there that get on your post and use your post when you're talking about the correct holy days based on the calculated calendar that God inspired and had Hillel II reveal to the public. And then Mr. Armstrong said, that was because there's not a Levitical priesthood today. We had to have that understanding for us in these latter days to be able to correctly know and verify and prove the days on which we should be keeping the holy days, observing the holy days, because there's not a Levitical priesthood in anywhere. And especially there's not one in Jerusalem from which the place from which the observations are to be made. And if God decides... He's going to cloud it up, so you have to use the calculated calendar. Sometimes that happens. A cloud will keep you from being able to see what is the real time, but the calculated calendar tells you <clears throat> that's it. When the Levitical priesthood was here, God would blow the clouds away where from the spot they're supposed to observe it, they could. But you try to observe it from America or from from U.S. or from the U.K., which is not the way God set it up to be done when there was a Levitical priesthood in, in place. There may be clouds that God's not going to blow away because you're not supposed to be observing it from here. It would be from there, and you are not supposed to be doing it. It's the Levitical priesthood that would do it and announce it. That was the way God showed who his servants and through who his line of authority, where it was. Now, he's removed the Levitical priesthood for now. So that also means we're not following observation. We're following what's been revealed to us that was done orically all along, brethren, when you understand. We're, you know, the calculated calendar, God had that prefigured. He doesn't do my hit or miss. He had that prefigured a long, long time ago. But, and, and we need to do what Mr. Armstrong said, that we all speak the same thing. Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all, that you all, that y'all, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Boy, there's something right there. How come we have 600 different blankety-blank this or that banana-peeling churches of God? Somebody not reading this? You tear this page out of your Bible? that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. And even though God has not reestablished one physical organization during this time, he's allowed us to be scattered, <clears throat> we can still follow that verse and be of the same mind, speak the same thing of the same spirit if we yield ourselves to God for that. Brother, and I needed to cover that because somebody pounded my post with I'm keeping Pentecost on some other not Pentecost I'm keeping Passover on some other day than last Thursday night because of the new moons they say well fella you got as soon as I saw that it didn't take me 15 seconds to hit the delete button on my post and bow zoom zap that comments off of my post your friends can see it <clears throat> and you can see it but not my friends. I deleted that without hesitation. Poof. I did do a little prayer. I said, God. And it, it, there was no need to ask. It was like, yes, delete it. <clears throat> and uh, that's gone. Because I'm not going to promote division. I'm not going to promote it, brethren. <clears throat> and and it's especially rebellious <clears throat> division. It's wrong. It's contrary to what we were instructed and taught by God's end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong by inspiration from God. Clearly, we have a calculated calendar, and I got it printed on the back of this little folding business card. You can have this for free, but I am going to ask this of you. Now, if you do a Holy Day offer, and I'll drop one in with your recipe, but if you are, just want some of these cards, I can put as many as seven, maybe eight, for, the, for one postage stamp in a small regular size, not the long business size, but a small regular size. I, I, I can't get as many in the longer envelope. It, it weighs more. But if you send a small envelope with a pre-stamped pre and addressed, I can send you as many as seven or eight of these little folding cards. And uh, 
I ask that you do that, brother, because I'm already <clears throat> at my limits of things to do. And if you'd like some of these cars I'm giving away, you can either come to my house. I'll hand you a whole, whole handful, as many as you want. Or if you're not, if it's not able for you to come to my house, you'd have to use gas to come to my house. I just ask that you get an envelope and put a stamp on it, addressed to you, mail it to me, and when I and up there under your return address, put. Uh, uh, calendar business card or calendar folding card and i'll put you seven or eight in there you don't have to send me any money just send me an envelope with a stamp on it and i'll i won't send you anything else in that envelope but a bunch of cards you know as many cards as for one ounce can go in there and i already waited at the post office we can get up to eight in there so you'd have one for yourself you can give away as many as seven that's something i'm giving you if you just come and get it here at my house or send me a pre-stamped addressed envelope where I don't have to take any time other than sticking some these cards in the envelope, put it back in the mailbox, boom, it's off to you, and you got a nice, this were very handy for when you get in situations, let's say a traffic officer stopped you wrongly and wrote you up a ticket, and you decided to go to court and fight it, and the judge wants to postpone the calendar date, and he picks some date, says, all right, can you come back on this date? If you say yes, and it was a holy day, you just messed up. But if you say, Your Honor, let me check my calendar real quick. You pull your calendar out of your pocket or out of your wallet or out of your purse, if you're a woman, and uh, check the back of this real quickly. The whole year is on here. And if it's the date he mentions, if it's highlighted in a, in a purple color, meaning a holy day, or highlighted as part of the Feast of Tabernacles in blue or in green as part of the uh, Pentecost or yellow as part of the Days of Unleavened Bread, I don't want to appear in court on days of Unleavened, during the Days of Unleavened Bread. <clears throat> just tell the judge, hey, I got a, I got a commitment at that time. If he wants to tell, you can tell him, hey, here's my card, Your Honor. You see the, the Leviticus 23 feast days. I'm, you know, we keep those, feast days, and a lot of those judges are Jewish anyway. They're going to know what you're talking about. Many of them are, not all, of course, but, but and if you had to appeal to another judge in case that judge tried to make you come on a certain date, you could just. You know, you'll, you'll wind up with a judge that's Jewish and who understands these days and will say, that man wants to keep those days, you let him off. <clears throat> and, but they never argue with you. You tell them that's not a good date for me. They'll just say, well, how about, and they'll pick another date two weeks later or something like that. But, but if you don't have this with you and you commit to a date, you're in trouble. <clears throat> you know, or anything else where you might have to be committing to a date with an employer. You can even tear this card in half, just give him the calendar part. He doesn't need the folding part. You can give him the whole folding part if he wants to keep that handy and know when you can work and when you can't work. This helps. This helps. It's on one thing, easy, simple to read. Your employer, whoever else, can see it real easy. I'm giving something to you on this holy day. Here's, you, know, you don't have to do anything to get it, but come and get these at my house, or if you can't come to my house, just send me a pre-stamped, pre-addressed envelope. And my address is on our contact page on cogtv.org also have it up here for you. I can back this up real quick. I'll just pop this right here. <clears throat> um, kind of cuts off the screen. You can put my name or you can put Church of God Ministry or Church of God Television Ministry or you can just abbreviate that COGTV. That stands for Church of God Television. Not a group you can join. Not a separate Church of God to which the baton has been handed. Just a ministry a service that we do here. There's my address, 1428, 14, you double it, you got 28, just a memory aid, 1428, Virginia Road, Bessemer, Alabama. We're also Huey Town, H-U-E-Y-T-O-W, and I'm in the county. I'm not really in a city, but the post office that delivers to us is Bessemer, B-E-S-S-E-M-E-R, Alabama 35023. Just send me an envelope, pre-stamped, pre-addressed, and if you want more than eight cards, just put an extra stamp on there. If I see two stamps on there, I'll double it. I'll put you twice as many cards in there. So however many you want, just put that many stamps times eight, and I'll keep throwing the cards in the envelope as much as they'll fit, as much stamps as you put on there. So there's a, my offering, my gift to you on this holy day. But then, brethren, I do need to remind you, let's go to the next scripture. Uh, <clears throat> let me bring this one back full screen just for a moment, and then we got to end this up and get back and get to Mr. Armstrong. Um, speak to the children of Israel, the 15th of the seventh day. Today is the 15th. You know, let me come back and show you this real quick. On my lower third, so that you'll understand, some of you do understand this already, I have both the Roman calendar date down here at the bottom, 
I'd be over here on this side under COG TV, the Roman calendar today. Today is Saturday on the Roman calendar, the Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, the 31st day of March, 2018. On this part of my lower third, down at the bottom there, under the Sabbath TV, the white line at the bottom where it says Holy Day, uh, Dub One, that's my abbreviation for the first day of Unleavened Bread. I just, to get it to fit the line, I just abbreviate it as much as you can abbreviate it, D-U-B-I, Day of Unleavened Bread One, first day of Unleavened Bread, the 15th of the first month. And Thursday night after sunset was the 14th of the first month. So why isn't the day the 16th? Well, because we don't change days at midnight. On God doesn't change days at midnight on the Hebrew calendar. Sunset. You go from sunset Thursday night to sunset last night Friday night. That's all the 14th. Then after sunset last night, it became the 15th. And even though midnight has passed, it's still the 15th during the daytime portion of this day today. It's still the first day of unleavened bread. We do the night to be much observed, as hopefully all of you did, last night after sunset on the 15th of the first month, the day following Passover um, and the first day of unleavened bread and the first holy day of the year, as you're going to hear Mr. Armstrong say in the sermon. When we get to it in a, in a moment. Uh, today is the 15th of the first month. Oh, wait a minute. Just a second. I got the wrong verse up here. That's that, uh, You know, it also works out that the 15th day of the seventh month is, is the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. So ah, I pulled the wrong scripture up. I'm sorry, brethren. We should be going. Now let me come back here and get. just keep that in the background. We should be going to Leviticus uh, 23, and it will be uh, probably somewhere right around verse 15 that is going to mention the 15th of the first month on which we do the first day of unleavened bread. Let's go there because this meet and due season, we need to cover what today is. And we'll get to that sermon. Stand by. Just getting your mind awake because Mr. Ipstone is going to, in this sermon, he's going to give you a lot of stuff. So your mind needs to be awake. So if I'm helping get you awake, I'm doing my job. All right, in verse in uh, Leviticus 23, chapter 23, starting in verse, well, we got to go back to about verse 10. Let's go to verse 9. And the eternal Lord God spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, and you shall reap the harvest, thereof you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits this is of your harvest unto the priest it's talking about the wave sheaf day and he shall wave the sheaf before the eternal lord god to be accepted for you on the morrow after the sabbath shall the priest wave it and so that's the morrow after today tomorrow is the wave sheaf day during this 2018 year Feast of Tabernacles. This picture is the resurrected Christ uh, ascending to heaven to be accepted by our Father, His Father, our Father, as the very first human being to be actually born of God, the first fruit of the first harvest of souls. You may say, well, wasn't it Christ as the Word was already with God from eternity with the Father? Yeah, but he wasn't born of the Father. He was already existing. Now, when he emptied himself and came as a human being and died and was resurrected, he was then the first of the human beings to be born of God. So he's the first of the first fruits. He's God's first begotten and born son. <clears throat> and then, uh, where were we? We left off on verse 10. No, we were at verse. Uh, we read through verse 11. Let's pick up verse 12. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheaf and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be, and it explains what the Levitical priesthood would be doing. Um, <clears throat> but for our part, what we're supposed to do, we pick up at verse 15. And you sh well, let's see, verse 14. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you've brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. 
And then verse 15 tells us, begins to tell us, and 16, how we count 50 days beginning with the wave sheaf day until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath of weeks, Sunday through Sabbath weeks, to the morrow after that seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. But uh, he goes back after that to saying in verse 17, you shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves of two tenths deals. They shall be baked with, they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the eternal. Uh, and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs and all right, we're, we're, we're into the, uh, hang on a second. I want to, I want to back up to where we are covering this uh, first day of unleavened bread. Oh, okay, yeah, we are coming back in verses um, 20 about the wave offering. 21, you shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a, holy convocation now, even though they do those two ways with leavened bread we don't uh, the Levitical priesthood what they do we don't bring it into our homes we don't eat the stuff we eat unleavened bread uh, let's go to verse um, hang on just a moment let me catch up with myself here Okay, verse, uh, here it is, verse 6, I really should be going back to. Sorry for the delay, brethren, but I want to get the right place. Verse 5 refers to Passover in the 14th day of this, of the first month, that even is the Lord's Passover, the eternal Lord God's Passover. And verse 6, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the eternal Lord God seven days you must eat unleavened bread. It doesn't have to be wheat if you're allergic to it. You can make or buy your unleavened bread with rye or any other grain that, you know, not allergic to and still make bread out of it. You must eat unleavened bread seven days. <clears throat> In the first day, verse 7, you shall have an holy convocation. That's what we're doing today. The 15th of the first month today. You shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. That makes it a sanctified, set apart, a holy day. But you shall offer an offering, verse 8, made by fire unto the eternal Lord God seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. That will be at the end of this week. <clears throat> and as God's end time apostle has explained to us, since we don't have the Levitical priesthood doing the offerings by fire, we instead of bringing a animal to sacrifice, we convert that to uh, Yankee dollars or British pound sterlings or wherever you are, and we bring it before the eternal Lord God's ministry. And if you've decided to, if you haven't decided you're helping some other local ministry that works with you real well, that you're happy with, you've prayed and fasted about it, and God says, yes, help this older minister in your area who's faithfully serving you, hasn't put a name on a group, Fine, keep it right there. This is just a reminder I'm required to do to remind you, do your Holy Day offering today. You can put it in the mail if you're distance away. <clears throat> if you're going to help this ministry, which you are welcome to do, you can either mail a check if you're going to mail it. <clears throat> you can do it electronically if you know how to electronically do a check. <clears throat> or you can do it from your uh, credit or debit card if that's the way you are wanting to do your offering. And if you go to our homepage cogtv.org brethren and scroll down on the right side <clears throat> you'll eventually toward the bottom it's not something i put prominent it but it's down there you just scroll down a ways and you will <clears throat> you will find on that page cogtv.org <clears throat> you get our mailing address if you didn't get it now on our contact page on that cogtv.org page but uh, if you use the menu on this and there's a contact menu tab but go down below, there's one that says Holy Day Offering or For Holy Days. Either one of those tabs will take you into an, an area where you can do a secure. And as we do it through, to me, what's one of the best secure services out there, PayPal. You don't have to be a mem make yourself a member. You can still use your credit card. They don't pass the credit card information to us or debit card. 
they keep it securely, and they they prove themselves to be very good and secure at that banking arrangement. <clears throat> and they don't pass that information to us, but they do pass the funds over to our Church of God ministry account. <clears throat> and it'll take you to our page labeled, <clears throat> abbreviated, Church of God Ministry. It'll have my name on it. It may even make a reference to COG TV or Church of God Television Ministry, but it'll be abbreviated overall as Church of God Ministry. You're at the right place if you get there. You can get there two or three ways. One is go to just go to COGTV.org, look for the uh, Holy Day Offering tab, hit that. Or <clears throat> you could type in HDO, standing for Holy Day Offering, dot cogtv.org that'll get you right to the paypal page where it just says you know fill in the amount for church of god ministry and that'll, that'll get it to this ministry and you're welcome to do it if you don't have another place i encourage you then you know on in prayer before god say god should i do it here and i believe he'll probably inspire you and you're welcome and i encourage you to uh, help this ministry that has put itself into a great amount of debt at high interest for the next 15 years if I if I don't get some help. So there, I'm giving you a little encouragement to say yes. On this holy day, the only time we'll pitch you for an offering when we're required to do that, brethren, I'll, I'll pitch you and say, yes, it's welcome. It will help here very much. I'll, I'll keep these going if I, you know, I've committed to God. I'll, whatever struggle it takes, I'll keep the night cast well, we now call it World Watch. I'll keep the nightly World Watch news related to the Bible and prophecy programs going Sunday through Thursday as much as I can. And I'll keep the weekend Sabbath services going. And let's get to what one of the primary things we had was to keep you with God's end time apostle and to keep it as lively and, and uh, alive as we can with what God was speaking to us by and through his most faithful servant for these Philadelphia days. We'll talk about that another time. Some of you people that call me and argue about, we're in the way of the sea era. No, we're not. God's end time apostle said that era does not begin until after the Great Tribulation begins, until after Philadelphia is taken away to a place of safety. Scripture proves that, especially Revelation 3.18. And yes, a Laodicean attitude is here big time. It's been here even while Mr. Armstrong was alive. But the era, officially commencing as an era, of Laodicea has not yet begun. That's an era of martyrdom. The martyrdom wholesale, they've cut off a few heads here and there, the IS people have, but the beast is not here. And the wholesale capitulation, cutting off of heads of, of faithful people who keep God's commands and refuse to bow down before the image of the beast, that's not here yet. That era, that time, the beast, the fifth seal is not open yet. That's the time of the Laodicean era as an era, formerly an era. Attitude here, yes, agreed. But as God's end time apostle explained, the era formally is not yet here. We're not in a time where people have left behind. If you've got the attitude, you still have time to repent. And I hope you will of a Laodicean lukewarm know-it-all attitude. Those people, they know a lot. They may know more than a Philadelphian's doing, but a Philadelphia's not perhaps doing as much study because he's doing what he learns and studies. He's doing what Christ instructed us to do in Luke 21, 36, to be watching and praying. All right, brethren, I'll beat you over the head with that another time. Let's get to Mr. Armstrong. I think I covered the, uh, the Holy Day offering. I gave you the scriptures three times in the year, and it means within those three times on each of the seven holy days, like each holy day says. I read you the verse from Leviticus 23, verses 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, somewhere in there that says, on this day you do an offering made by fire. Mr. Epstein has explained, without the Levitical priesthood, we don't do the fire, you don't burn your money. You give, you give it, hope you don't mind a little humor there. You give it to your, a minister of God that's serving faithfully. And if it's somebody local, great, help that man who's helping you and giving you opportunity for fellowship and not created a divisive blankety blank banana peeling church of God named group that makes you think, oh, this is now the church of God following what Mr. Armstrong did as he organized us under name, meaning Philadelphia era church of God uh, worldwide. 
No, that hasn't happened. God didn't want us naming other than for a legal reason when we were one body to distinguish legally from the Church of God, Indiana. Uh, you, you know, and I'll play that for you this afternoon. Let's get, we got to get to Mr. Armstrong. We've got to have time left for his sermon with the scrolling text. We're going to go over just a little bit this morning. Brethren, this is a holy day. I'll give you time for, um, for lunch, and then we will, uh, those who want to come back like we used to do in the beginning, we'll have a second service after time out for lunch. Uh, I'm, I may move the afternoon service to a later time. I'll tell you at the end of it today. So we can have two services, two first day of unleavened bread, and we'll, this afternoon we'll launch right into it. I'll play you that, and I'll play you Mr. Armstrong's comment about how we're not, we're never members of the, we shouldn't be saying we're members of the Radio Church of God or Worldwide Church, Church of God. That principle applying, you'll see when I play it for you, how that principle applies today to any other named blankety-blank, this or that, banana-peeling Church of God group that some ministers have in wrong principle set up out there. Contrary to the teaching God gave us through his end-time apostle Herbert Armstrong, contrary to the instruction to ministers in Titus 1, verses 7 through 9, telling us to hold fast and to teach as we were taught. You're ignoring God's end-time apostle when you've set up a group under some name, blankety-blank, this or that, banana-peeling Church of God group. All right, I was trying to take it easy and not step on too many toes, especially on days we pitch you for a Holy Day offering and say you can send it here. I, some of you are going to be mad at me, but I'm telling you the truth whether you like me about it or not. <laughs> because that's what I've committed to do and that's what I'm going to do and it's a, that's intended to help save your can I say B-U-T-T -T, or should I say life? To save your life from being subjected to having to give it to the beast. Read Revelation 3.18. If you get left behind, you can buy your way out of it by buying of God gold tried in the fiery trial of martyrdom. Brother, we've got to go to Mr. Armstrong. I'll, I'll punch that some other time, as you've heard me do before, if you stay with me very long. All right. Now, this should make my hitting you hard once or twice. may make it easy to be able to focus on a recording. We've got the scrolling text with it. Let's get right into it. Sermon from the uh, first day of unleavened bread. I'll need to set a couple of buttons, brethren. And so let me pull this, not this one, excuse me. That's where we're going to go. But what I need to do is set something to get the audio rolling with the script we have. Just bear with me for a moment. And I'll, I'll start the audio, and then we'll switch back to the... We'll switch back to the uh, screen with the scrolling text. I think... I've got the audio right here. Mr. Armstrong. Now this is the day that the world calls Easter. I presume many of you... All right, brethren, at the time he was speaking, it happened that Sunday, back in 1981, happened to be Easter. My notes are going to start where he picks up after having talked about Easter, saying today is the first day of the annual Holy Day. So just wait for that and written in for the literature, but we will know that later. But I hope it'll be a good number. But today is not Easter here. All right, no, I'm going to hold him. He's going to start with these words. But brethren, as you can see, I have a small problem on the screen. Um, I need to make a quick adjustment, and I'm going to do it while we're live. Please stand by. I'm going to adjust that so that it fits the screen properly. Okay. Uh, oh, that didn't work. Um, 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 let me see. Oh. Um, all right. I think I have another button. When you're live, you can have one of these things goofy up like this. Let's see. I think I may be able to make the adjustment on this one where it'll work. Let's see. Okay. No. I've got to select a whole other way to do this. Okay. Um, I've had you be patient so far. Patience is a virtue. Um, 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 um. All right. 
I can change that to a different setting here. Uh, um, well, I hate it when things go wrong, go live, go wrong when you're live. Okay, I'm going to switch over to this screen for a moment so that what you're seeing is not all the fumbling around I have to do to get this to fit and make it work. Please, brethren, just bear with me for a moment. I have about something, I'm exaggerating, but I have something close to half a million buttons to push to make all this work correctly and get it right for us. <clears throat> Okay, yeah, see how I can do it. I'll have to size this screen and window down, and I hope it's going to work. Okay. All right, we're getting there. Oh, yeah, okay, and this will, for those who are hard of hearing, this will keep the captions from a from a pre-typed script on screen for you. Oh yeah, that's going to fit nicely. Okay, brethren, I've got it. So, and we've got Mr. Armstrong queued now to the point where well, I didn't quite get that exactly. Let's get that over a little more. I've got him queued to where it's going to pick up here on this script. Yeah, there we go. And let me roll the script. Oh, yep, 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 yep. That's where he's going to pick up, right there as we go. Back to Mr. Armstrong now, brethren. This is the point we wanted to pick up from where he's saying, today is the first of the annual holy days, and it is. Passover was a feast day, not a holy day. Today is the first of the annual holy days for this year, and the beginning of, well, he's going to explain. Here, let's go back to him. Today is the first of the annual holy days and the beginning of the, well, yesterday or night before last really was the beginning of the seven annual festivals. Now God has given the church seven annual festivals and also seven annual holy days and they do not entirely coincide. For example, the Passover night before last was one of the seven festivals, but it's not a holy day. But it was a very sacred, and I should say holy, service. But why did God give us these seven annual festivals? I don't know any other church on earth that observes them. When I was challenged Fifty-four years ago, fifty-four and a half years ago now, and I didn't know very much about the Bible up to that time. I'd been brought up in a respectable Sunday school. Brother, please stand by just one more moment. I see something I need to correct. It will make it easier to read this if I get the bottom of this adjusted down a little lower for you. And... Let's see, left and right, up and down would be this way. Okay, you'll see the change I'm making in just a moment. You won't see it right away. But when I hit this button now, you'll see, you should see this get larger. Um, there we go. Now, I think that'll be a little easier to read and follow. And church... All I knew was that I, I thought I knew that uh, there is a God, and I thought I knew that, uh, well, they told me I had a birthright membership in the church, whatever that is. Nobody has a birthright membership in this church. And also I thought I was an immortal soul, and I thought that if I was good, I'd go to heaven when I died, and if not, I'd roast forever in hell, but never burn up quite. But I was challenged, and I had to begin to study the Bible. I was also challenged on the doctrine of evolution. So I began studying 
Darwin, Huxley, Haeckel, Spencer, some of the modern evolutionists, and even Lamarck and Laplace before Darwin. Their writings are rather convincing, necessarily, or you wouldn't find practically the entire intellectual uh, world of higher education accepting that doctrine. It is a doctrine that really you can't believe it and believe in God. It says there is no God because evolution is the atheist's attempted explanation of the presence of a creation without a creator. No creator. No mastermind fought anything out. All of the things we see, all of the design, the marvelous design in nature, everything that happens in an animal body, a human body, such a miraculous mechanism, it just happened. No one thought it out. No human mind ever could think out anything like it, however, because a human mind isn't quite that bright. So I had to prove whether or not God exists, and I did prove it to my satisfaction, and I've proved it to the satisfaction of the few atheists. But when I came to study the Bible, I found it said things that I didn't believe. First, I couldn't agree with it, because I suppose that what I'd been taught in church and Sunday school was the truth. Everybody believes what he's always heard, what he's always been taught, what he has read, what his peers believe. Almost everybody believes like that. I did. I began to see that the Bible said just the opposite of what I believed and what I'd been taught. I went into it and checked a little further and found the Bible didn't contradict itself, and it was absolutely true. Inside of six months, I had come to have proof that God exists. I had come to have proof that the Bible is the Word of God. In its original writings, there are maybe a few mistakes in any one translation. There are many translations, and there are thousands of copies of the original Hebrew and the original Greek and so on. And so we can come to the exact truth in any one text or any one verse if we want to. Of course, some people don't have enough time. They're too busy doing nothing or wasting their time. But I was being challenged on the weekly Sabbath. My wife, the wife of my youth, had taken up with the weekly Sabbath, said she got it out of the Bible. I said, the Bible says thou shalt observe Sunday. She said, show me. I couldn't, but I tried to. She said, how do you know the Bible says that? I said, because all of the churches observe Sunday and they get their doctrine and their belief and their teaching out of the Bible. But I had to find out that they got their teaching somewhere else, that the Bible says precisely the opposite and that they're preaching the precise opposite of what the Bible says and teaches. It was quite an experience. My head was swimming for a while. It made me think of the way women used to have a house cleaning in the spring. Everything would be all upset and dusty and dirty and all mixed up for a little while until they got it straightened out and put back in place again. That's the way my mind was. I was all ready to accept the Sabbath, because I found it proved in the Bible and not Sunday. And then I found a text in Colossians 2.16 that upset me. That had to do with the annual Sabbaths or holy days 
Oh, thank you. Well, that, that is not the one I use, but I think this one will do. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, well, now we did bring the right one. I'll just have to tell you, I'm glad my mind is not deteriorating like my hearing and my eyesight. But I have to use about four different magnifying glasses of different strengths. Those that I have to use of the most powerful strength only, only show me just a little spot. I can't see it very, very much. So I use others that will cover a wider amount of space, more tight, where I can, but they're not as strong. But uh, I can't even use this glass. It used to be strong enough. When I got the present Bible, it's a big, heavy Bible, it isn't the Bible I used to use, I didn't need a magnifying glass. I could read it. Now I have to have a magnifying glass, and even the first one won't do, and I have to use a still smaller one. So pardon this little interruption. Just thought I might explain that to you. You will learn that I am human just like you are. And we all are. If you look for a leader who is not human but is divine, you're just not going to find it in this time and this age. We're all sinners saved by God's grace, or being saved, rather, I should say. Anyway, I came to find out that that particular verse did not do away with those days. I thought it did away because I always assumed it did away with the annual holy days or annual Sabbaths. I'd been reading some Seventh-day Adventist literature and other literature, and they all said it did. Well, I said, if it does, it does away with the weekly Sabbath also because they're all lumped together there. And then I found every place in the Bible where all those days are mentioned together from the Old Testament and the New. And in no place is it talking about doing away with days. It's only talking about things they used to have to do on some of those days that were a substitute for the blood of Christ and for the Holy Spirit. And we don't do some of those things any longer on any of those days. Then I came to see that we must keep the annual holy days. I didn't understand about all of the festivals yet. I didn't understand about the Feast of Tabernacles. I didn't understand why. I did ask why. I've always wanted to know why about everything. But I didn't know why. I just knew God says do it. I found these days were ordained forever. I found Christ observed them. I found the early apostles observed them. The church observed them. Well, then where did the church get off the track? Off the track. It did get off the track along somewhere. I just knew God said, do it. I did it. That was 54 years ago. And I've been doing it ever since. And a lot of you have joined me since. For the first seven years, only my wife and myself observed these days. No church on earth was doing it. I brought this knowledge to the Sardis uh, era of the church. I was laughed to scorn. They would not accept it. They were hostile against the idea, even against the scriptures. They would accept what truth they had. They kept the weekly Sabbath, but they would go no further. Brethren, I tell you, if you accept just what you've received and will go no further and accept no more truth, you stop learning right there. You stop your entire experience with God right there. And you start dying instead of living from that time on. God called Abraham and said, get out of this country where you are and all of the bright lights of Babylon here and go over to a land I'm going to show you. It's 
kind of a desolate land over there, and it's not like Babylon. But Abraham didn't say, well, why do I have to go? He didn't say, well, can't I go some other time? He didn't say, no, I don't want to, so I won't do it. It just says, Abraham went, that's all. That's why Abraham is the father of the faithful and why God made all of the promises that apply to you and me to Abraham. Well, I had to do the same thing. I didn't understand why. But today I'm going to ask why. I think a lot of you don't know altogether why we observe these days. There is a reason. I'm not going to go into a dissertation about the Days of Unleavened Bread today. I want to tell you why God gave us all seven of the annual festivals with the seven annual holy days in them. There are two holy days in the day, seven Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, there are one festival, seven Days of Unleavened Bread, but there are two holy days. The Passover is a festival in a sense. It's one of the seven festivals, but it is not a holy day. We think of two holy days in the Feast of Tabernacles, but it is not. The Feast of Tabernacles is seven days, and the last day, which is a holy day, is a separate festival altogether. Now, the world knows nothing of this. The world observes Easter today instead. And Easter has no meaning. They say, well, Christ rose on that day, but that doesn't mean anything to them, and Jesus did not rise on Sunday. I've had two programs a week ago, and then again this morning, and there will be on, it'll be on tonight again, at the, I believe it's 8.30 tonight, I'm not sure. The same program that you saw this morning, I presume. God's festivals are concerned with the question of why God put human beings on the earth. You know, it's a funny thing to me. I can't understand it. Most people are not concerned about why, they're, why they were born. They're not concerned about why they live. How did we come to be here? Where are we going? What is the purpose of our lives? Is there any purpose? Were we put here? Did God put us here? Did he have a purpose? Or did we just come by purposeless, in, uh, uh, purposeless evolution? By resident forces and not by any being that thought it out. But God did put humans on earth and he put us here for a purpose. Now in the world, there is a gigantic missing dimension in knowledge. We have educational institutions all over the world. We have our higher education. They pride themselves on the high education. Oh, yes, they become very professional in higher education. They're filled with vanity, self-importance, but they are half-baked. They are only half there. Their minds are only half there. And when it comes to knowledge, they have less than half of all there is that they should have. I'll give you one little example. In the decade of the 60s, the world's fund of knowledge doubled. But the world's troubles and problems and evils doubled also. Now, of course, the additional knowledge didn't cause the additional problems and troubles. But it didn't solve the others either that we already had. We've made great progress in the world mechanically, materialistically, but our troubles have escalated until they're greater today than at any time in history unless it was just before the flood. Jesus said as it was in the time of the flood, so it would be now, and it is now. <clears throat> There's a gigantic missing dimension in education. Our accomplishments in the world are materialistic. The human mind can think materially. 
But our problems and our troubles are spiritual in nature, and our minds can't think spiritually. Spiritual things are so much foolishness to the average mind. The world will avoid religion or anything spiritual. It's only concerned with the physical, the material. The world is ignorant of the purpose of human life. The world is ignorant of the human potential, the incredible human potential. And the world knows nothing about it. They don't know why we're here. They don't know where we're going. They don't know how to get there. They don't know anything about it. They don't know where we're going, and they don't know the way. They have lost their way, and they're going the wrong way. It's like I've told it a few times, and everybody's heard it time and again, that old joke about the good news and the bad news about the airplane plane pilot. And of course, it's all fictitious because no airplane pilot would be like this. Who said, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, and I have both good news and bad news, and I'll give you the bad news first. We are lost. We have lost our way. We don't know which direction we're going. We don't know where we're going. Now, I'll give you the good news. We're making extra fast time. <laughs> well, that's true in the world. The world is lost. It doesn't know where it's going, but it is going there very rapidly. Actually, it's going to its own destruction. If God were not going to intervene, which, of course, he is, God had a very great purpose. And God's great purpose is that he's reproducing himself. God is creating from physical matter human beings that will have a spiritual creation and ultimately will be changed from physical to spiritual and will become spirit-born beings will become God beings just as God is. God is a family and God is reproducing himself and it's going to be a very big family some of these days. And God's purpose is to make us like he is. It is the creation, starting with people made out of matter, out of the dust of the ground and inculcating into us the character of God. That's holy, righteous character, which is the ability to discern the true from the false, the true values, right from wrong, to choose the right, even though you have every pull and every temptation to want to go the way of the wrong. To have the character to resist the wrong and against your own will, go the right way, but call on God for the help you need because you won't have enough power and strength in yourself to do it. The one who can overcome himself, the world, and the devil. But that's a long process, and we don't do it all at once. It takes a long time. It takes a lifetime. And I think we'll still be overcoming and still improving in the resurrection. But God gave us seven annual festivals to teach us every year, remind us every year, over and over again, of his wonderful master plan, plan to accomplish that purpose, to make us like God is, to turn us from human beings into God beings from the kind of character we have had into the divine, holy, righteous character that God has. Now, to show you that, I, I'm not going to spend so much time on just the days of unleavened bread. We get that every year, and I'll leave that to the other ministers. And we certainly need that lesson, the lesson of putting sin out of our lives. Not one of us has accomplished it thoroughly yet, we still have to work on it. But I want to give you the overall meaning. 
So I'm going to begin at the beginning, and the beginning is not Genesis 1-1. The average person, if you ask them where does the Bible begin, he'd say Genesis 1 verse 1. But in the order of time sequence of what took place first, that is not the beginning. The beginning is John 1 verse 1 in the New Testament. John verse 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, the Word comes from the, uh, it was written originally in uh, the Greek language, and the word there uh, used was logos, but it means word. It means spokesman, the one who speaks. But it is the name of a person, a divine person. And that person was named the Word, the spokesman. And the Word was with God. And the Word himself was also God. Now you have two beings. There is the Word, and there is the other one with him who is God. You have two beings, and they're both God, because the Word is also God. The same was in the beginning with God. Now, how far back the beginning is, the Bible doesn't tell us. That might have been billions times trillions of years. We don't know. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now we read in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we find that it became Jesus Christ. The one who originally was the word had existed forever eternally. There never was a time when he did not exist. There was no father, no mother. There's no time when he was born. He has always existed. Your mind won't accept that. I guess you'll have to accept it without accepting it, whatever that is. But it is true. Now in the, see, it was the third or fourth chapter of uh, Ephesians, to read how God, God the Father, created all things by Jesus Christ. He is the Word, and God did the creating through Christ, and Christ is the Word who spoke, and the Holy Spirit is the power that acted when He spoke and did it. But He did only what the Father told Him to do. So you have the Father, and you have the Son, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit all in creation. Now then, God created angels before he created anything else. He created spirit beings. God is composed wholly of spirit. And at first there was no matter. There was no material universe. Just wasn't any. But he created spirit. And he created spirit beings called angels. And then... We turn back to Genesis 1 1. This is some time later, and we read in the beginning, God, and here the word for God is Elohim, which is a uni plural, it means more than one person. It means the same two persons I just read you about in John 1 1, the Word and God. Created the heavens and the earth, and it should be plural, heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in Job, the book of Job, 38th chapter, I want you to notice something here. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job had just built a great building. He had just built the Great Pyramid, as a matter of fact. The only building where the cornerstone is the top capstone, and that's mentioned here. Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, of which have been the top and the last stone laid? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
Now, on the Great Pyramid, the top cornerstone never was laid, but on the earth it was. And all the stars of God, there again stars, like I said yesterday, are a symbol for angels. And all of the holy angels shouted for joy. Now, God had created angels first. Angels were already there when he created the earth. But he not only created the earth, he created the heavens and the earth. And you read further where he created the entire universe at the same time. Now, I, do, I don't know how long ago that was. People think that all of this first chapter was 6,000 years ago. That is not true. <laughs> we read now back in Genesis 1, verse 2. The earth was, or the word was, as elsewhere translated, became. And to be that way, it had to become that way anyway. The earth became without form and void. The Hebrew words there are tohu and bohu, and they mean chaotic in confusion, deteriorated, waste, and empty. They mean, what is the word I want? Anyway, the, the earth had, uh, uh, had well, I, I'll think of the word just a little bit later. Um, Now, the government of God was established on the earth and had been, and uh, he had put angels on the earth. They shouted for joy at the creation of the earth because it was to be their abode, their home. And God established a government over them. It was the government of God. For the first created beings, God established his government. A government regulates your way of life. All government is based on a basic constitution or a basic law, which is always has to do with a way of life and the regulating of that way of life among those ruled by the government. Now, there was a throne on earth. There was a throne on earth at that time. So we come now to Isaiah. Now, wait a minute, I'm getting way ahead of myself. I wanted to explain a few other things first. God had first created angels. Then the angels were here and shouted for joy when he created the earth. He put, a, put his government over the angels. There was a throne on the earth. So we want to turn now to Isaiah. Isaiah 14, and beginning with verse 12. Speaking of a super archangel, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? One of three arch archangels that God had created. They were higher than other ordinary angels of greater power, of greater mind, greater ability. The highest, most powerful type of being God could create or ever did create that we know of. How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations, or thou which did weaken the nations cut down to the ground? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. So there was a throne on earth for the ruling of that government. I will exalt my throne above the stars or the angels of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. That's the only thing in the Bible, only place in the Bible that gives you any idea of where God's heaven and the throne of God is located in the far, far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like or will be the most high it could read. He was going to take over the whole universe and take over the government of God. It's a funny thing. Some other humans have tried to take over the government of God, even in this church. That's what Lucifer wanted to do, and it's what made him Satan the devil. So he rebelled. And... 
that turned into sin. Now we go a little farther back here into Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28. And we find, uh, beginning here with verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And God said, I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy way, in all thy ways, in thy ways, from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. He was perfect, but he was created, a created being, till iniquity was found in him. But he was cast back down. He led the angels into sin. Now back in the New Testament in 2 Peter, the second chapter in the fourth verse, we read about the angels who sinned, who followed him in his sin and rebellion against the government of God. The government of God was established on the earth. It's based on a law, and that law is the law of God. And that law is, the you sum it up in one word, love. But for man now, it's divided into two divisions, love toward God and love toward fellow man. The principle was the same over angels, love for one another, and love, first of all, toward God and obedience to God. The angels, though, sinned, were cast down to Tartaru, it should be, which is a place of restraint, the only place in the Bible the original word Tartaru there is used in the Greek, and delivered and unto chains and darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So there is a judgment coming on angels. Incidentally, did you ever notice that we in the church are to judge angels? They have a judgment day coming too. There's nothing said about the former Lucifer or Satan ever coming to a time of judgment, but the angels under him will. And judgment is not a time of condemnation and punishment. Judgment is a trying as to whether you shall have to be condemned and punished or whether you are to receive eternal salvation and eternal life. So maybe there is hope for the fallen angels. And we are to judge angels. All right, now back to Genesis 2 and verse 2. A result of that sin of the angels on the earth and Lucifer and under Lucifer, we come to verse 2. The earth was or became without form and void. It was in a state of decay. Now, decay is not a created state. You don't create something that's decay. Decay is something that had to take place after creation, a rotting, a decaying situation. That's what the earth was actually, or became. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. There had been light. God's truth and God's way is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. But Satan is the author of darkness. And so the whole earth was covered with darkness. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters. Now right at that point, I want you to notice now the 104th Psalm. The 104th Psalm and verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy Spirit, they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. God renewed the face of the earth. It had become decayed as a result of the sin of angels. That might have been billions and billions of years. They're immortal. They don't just live 70 years and die. Angels were made to live eternally. They have life in themselves. They're composed of spirit. So they, they die. Now back to Genesis again. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, thou renewest the face of the earth. Notice here, there was darkness. The spirit of God moved upon the waters. Then God said, the one who did the saying was the word, the spokesman. 
He said, let there be light. And God saw the light that it was good. The Spirit of God was there over the waters and the Spirit of God is the power that brought light. And God divided the light from the darkness. And then in six days God renewed the face of the earth for man. That was only a renewing of the earth and making it ready and it was beautiful the way God renewed it. But man has destroyed it also. Man has polluted, perverted, ruined everything, every material thing and everything of this earth that man has ever gotten his dirty hands on. Angels brought this earth to desolation and ruin and decay. Man has been doing the same thing because man has been motivated by the fallen angel Lucifer who has become Satan the devil. Now in verse 26, after God had renewed the face of the earth for man, we find that the eternal God said, let us, you see, it's not just me, let us. This includes God and the Word. And it's the Word who did the speaking now. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now he had made the cattle after their likeness, after the cattle kind. He made dogs after the dog kind, elephants after the elephant kind, and fish after the fish kind. But now he said, let's make man after the God kind, after our kind. Man was made in the image of God, in the same form and shape as God, but man was made out of matter and not out of spirit. Second chapter and verse 7 of Genesis. The eternal God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Made out of the dust of the ground, not out of spirit like angels. But when he breathed air in and out of his nostrils, what was made out of the ground became a soul. A soul then came out of the ground. And a soul can die. Now God made man without life. Did you ever, ever think of that before, that way? God didn't make man with life. He didn't give him life. He gave him a chemical, temporary existence. No, he was temporarily living, but he was a living being made of matter. But that was not life. There were two trees in the Garden of Eden where God put the man he'd created and his wife with him. And one of those trees was the tree of life. And if God, God offered him that tree, and if he took of that tree, he would have taken life, and God would have given him life. But he didn't have life. He had only a temporary, mechanical, physical existence. That's all. That's all you and I have except by the Spirit of God through conversion. And the world as a whole doesn't have that. Now notice verses 15 on and on to 17 in the second chapter. The eternal God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And uh, the, the, the eternal God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, and that included the tree of life, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Man was made mortal with a temporary life, subject to having that life cease, and he would die. Angels can't die. They're immortal. But man was made to die. Adam rejected life. God offered him the tree of life. Adam took to himself the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, the knowledge of good and evil. And in so doing... Adam rejected the government of God. The government of God that had been set on the earth 
with Lucifer on that throne, and his name is now Satan, and he's still on that throne. And he's still ruling the earth and all of the earth's governments. The governments of this world are ruled by Satan, the devil. He sits on the throne of the earth. Adam made that decision not only for himself, but for his children. And his children are the world. All humanity are the children of Adam. And he made that decision for them. So, we read over in the third chapter of Genesis, beginning of verse 32. And the eternal God said, Now, lest he, the man, put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever and gain life, gain immortality. He didn't have life. He was dying every, every, every minute he lived. Dying is a process. It takes the average of 70 years for the average person to die. Some die in the first few minutes of birth, almost like a stillbirth. Some die after one or two years. Some live on to be 60, 70, 80, or even 90 or 100. Not too many. Therefore, the eternal God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. And he placed at the east in the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, lest a man go back and gain life. Mankind now was shut off from life. Now get that point, brethren, because the churches don't get it. They don't understand it. Mankind is shut off from life, and they're also shut off from God. Now I want to make that plain as we go along now, more than we ever have before. Adam rejected life. He rejected God's way. He rejected God's law, the basis of God's government, which is a way of life, <clears throat> a way to make us happy. God will not give us immortal life in unhappiness. If you won't live the way to make you happy, God won't give you eternal life. Adam refused to do that. He took to himself the knowledge of how to live, and that was the wrong way to live. And he did that and made the decision for all of his family, and now God merely uh, endorsed that decision by driving Adam and his posterity out of that garden and barring in a re-entrance to gain life. So, I want you to notice now a little bit of God's system of duality. I've mentioned so many times that everything that God does in his plan is in a dual way. There's a first and a second a former and a latter. There was the first Adam, there is the second Adam. The first Adam was made of matter. The second Adam was the Lord from heaven, was spirit. The first Adam gave us death, the second Adam will give us life. <clears throat> now I'd like to have you notice in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, First Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 22. For as in Adam all die. We're dying every minute, every second you live. You're only one breath away from death. Just one breath. If you don't take the next breath, you will never live. Uh, you, you'll be dead in, what, I don't know, five, eight, ten minutes, certainly. You can't, you can't live 10 minutes without a breath of air. You're only one breath away from absolute death. As an Adam, all die. We've all got that to look forward to. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. The same all, everybody, is going to be made alive in Christ. Now he's talking here of a resurrection. This is the resurrection chapter. Because after they die, they're going to come up by a resurrection to life. But it says every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Jesus was resurrected 1950 years ago. Um, afterward, they that are Christ's 
See, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then will come the end, and it doesn't go on to explain that in 1 Corinthians 15 here, but other chapters and other places in the Bible do. Uh, now I'd like to have you notice another scripture in that line, Hebrews 9 verse 27. And as it, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, people don't understand judgment. We're going to have to deal a great deal more about judgment in the church of God. We haven't dealt on that very much in this church. Judgment is not a condemning and a punishing. Judgment is a trial to see whether you are going to gain eternal life in God's judgment or whether you're going to be condemned and punished. And the punishment is death, and it is eternal death, and it is a second death. Because everyone who dies in Adam is going to be resurrected as a result of Christ's resurrection. And then the judgment. And the second death will come after that judgment. But the world is not judged. The world has never been judged and is not now being judged. Now, put another way, the world has not had a chance of salvation. Judgment is not a condemning. Judgment is not a uh, punishing. It is really an opportunity to receive salvation and eternal life. That's what it is. But man was shut off from it. Man was absolutely shut off from it. Now, Adam had cut humanity off from the Holy Spirit until that judgment. It's appointed as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. It's appointed to man once to die, now we die in Adam. But after that, the judgment, and we're resurrected through Christ for the judgment, which is really an opportunity for salvation. Brethren, I think we haven't understood that. I may be getting on in years a little bit, but God is still teaching me things, and I'm still teaching you. Now, many of you have never understood that before. Be sure and get that and understand that. Adam had cut humanity off from the Holy Spirit until the judgment. And the judgment has not come on the world yet. The judgment will come on the world when it is resurrected to that judgment. But through Christ, judgment was open to the church when Christ came. Now get that. Judgment was open by Christ, the second Adam, just for the church, the first fruits only, but not for all the world. I want to show you that and show you how Jesus said that no man could come to him except the Father which sent him draws us. And God isn't drawing very many. The world is cut off and the world is not being judged and the world is deceived and the world is ruled by Satan and the world is deceived and going into false ways instead of God's holy day today, they're having their pagan Easter. Now, they're all going to know better someday. They don't know now, and you can't convince them now. You'd just be talking into a deaf ear if you try to convince any of them, because you can't do it. I've tried, and I haven't succeeded. God called some of you, and so you heard when you heard the voice. But judgment was open to those that God called at the time of the church and were only the first fruits. Now, understand this. Through Adam... The world was cut off, but through Christ, the judgment was open to the church and later will be open to everybody. But it's only open to the church so far, and there's a reason for that. Now, God called the church of uh, the Old Testament through Moses, but they were not called to judgment. They were merely his nation on earth, 
And as a church, they were called the Congregation of Israel. And they are called the church in the wilderness, even in, I think it's the seventh chapter of Acts in the New Testament. But they were not judged. They did not have the Holy Spirit. They were not offered eternal life. They were not judged. We've often wondered about why did God call ancient Israel? Why did he call them and not offer them any salvation? Judgment hadn't come for them, but he wanted to give them his government, his laws to see that man with Satan on the throne here would never go with God's way, and Israel never did, although they had his law. They had his truth. Now, physical existence, this material chemical existence that we have, breathing air, a heart pumping blood, and you have to live by refueling yourself about, we do it usually about three times a day with food and water, <clears throat> but that's only to keep a temporary existence going. And it comes all out of the ground, doesn't it? Just like we did. But life begins with Christ. Life didn't begin with Adam. Adam never had life. He only had a chemical existence. And God shut mankind off from getting life when he drove, drove them out of the Garden of Eden. Now get that. Adam did not have life. The children of Adam have not had life. Christ, the second Adam, a spirit man, made the flesh and coming in the likeness of human flesh brought the Holy Spirit and life to those that God himself chose and called for a special reason and a special purpose. So life began with Christ, just as the physical existence began with Adam. But life now began with Christ. The whole plan of salvation began with Christ, not with Adam. Israel had a type of it in the sense of duality. They were a church, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They didn't have life, but they did have some of the things of God. They had the laws of God, which they did not obey. Now God gave to them, because they were the church, seven annual festivals to be a type of God's plan for carrying out his purpose of reproducing himself and making God beings out of us. Brethren, I tell you, we have to realize what a tremendous thing God had in mind for us and had in mind for Adam. Adam could have become a God being, but he re re rejected the tree of life, and he wanted to take everything to himself. He got on the getting side. He'd have to have given himself to God to have uh, life, and he never did receive life. But life begins with Christ. The Old Testament church had a picture uh, that they could not understand through these holy days, but they didn't understand the meaning of the holy days. The holy days picture God's plan of changing us from mortal to immortal, from man into God. But ancient Israel didn't understand it. They couldn't. They didn't have God's spirit. All right, let's turn then to 1 Corinthians now. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5 and verses 7 and 8. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, and speaking of these days of unleavened bread here, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as you are unleavened, that is, getting sin out of your life, because leaven is a type of sin. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We celebrated that night before last. Therefore, let us keep the feast, and speaking here, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Next, I'd like to have you notice that the uh, festivals are a type that were given to ancient Israel. However, they didn't understand it. They didn't know why they did it. I didn't know why when I started, not for several years, but God finally did explain it to me. But I had to obey first and find out why later. All right, back to Leviticus now, uh, Leviticus 23. Brethren, and right there, because we're a little over two hours at this point this morning, <clears throat> we're going to take a break for a couple of hours. We'll plan to come back here at uh, 2.30 Central Time. I'm going to give you a couple hours to go out and have lunch. And those that want to come back and we'll hear the rest of this sermon, I think a good stopping point, uh, beginning in verse 4. I think, where was he? Leviticus 23, verse 4, where Mr. Armstrong will pick up these are the festivals the feast or festivals of, of the eternal some of them even holy convocations days not to do any servile work as today is both from the weekly standpoint and the annual but let's break and when we come back i i won't give any long dissertations we will just i'll just say hello welcome back for lunch and um We'll save a hymn for the end of the second service, and we'll just come back and um, launch right in. Let's all go have a nice break. We are, like Mr. Einstein was saying, we're a physical, chemical existence. be good to get some little bit of food, unleavened bread. Remember now, if you go out anywhere during these next couple hours, you don't forget. Let them put bread on the table, and you, and you not thinking, pick it up and eat it. I actually did that one time. But years, 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 decades ago. So uh, just a reminder that today is first day of unleavened bread. Let's come back uh, a little more than a couple hours from now, 2.30 Central Time. Just figure it out from wherever you are if you're going to come back with us. And we'll pick up with a p.m. service to the U.S. after a little break. Happy, uh, happy first day of unleavened bread. Catch you later.